Welcome back to our series on the Book of Jeremiah, which is sponsored by the Christadelphian Video Service. We're doing a series of 15 talks on Jeremiah and the faithful remnant surviving the last days. And today we're looking at the faithful family of Shaphan, which is study number six. Well, in our last two studies, we looked at a couple of very evil characters, the evil Jehoiakim, whose policy from his youth was that he wouldn't hear the word of God, and his wife, the proud Nehushta, dwelling in her palace of cedars with the painted vermilion windows. And it's been very tragic to see how wrong people can get in their thinking and how proud they can become and the judgments to which they're subjected. So we're now going to go on to some much more positive characters in the book of Jeremiah who supported Jeremiah and the things that he did. And we're going to start with the faithful family of Shaphan. So after Josiah died, Jeremiah's sufferings intensified. And let's just remind ourselves of what was said about Jeremiah in the book of Hebrews, where it says, Take my brethren, the prophets, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of endurance. What shall I say more? For the time would fail me, says the writer of Hebrews, to tell of the prophets. And others who had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. And that verse, verse 36, is Jeremiah's unique verse. All of those things happen to Jeremiah especially. And so God is very much mindful of these prophets who suffered so much. And with Josiah dead, then Jeremiah's sufferings would only intensify. We read further on in Hebrews. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. And the Bible says, of whom the world was not worthy. And Jeremiah was to suffer some horrible things from the point onwards where Josiah died. And it didn't take long in the evil reign of Jehoiakim for Jeremiah to be under house arrest, under threat of death, and later on in the reign of Zedekiah to be put in horrible imprisonments. And so he would suffer in many ways. But God loved his faithful spokespeople. They suffered cruel mockings every day. There was that complaint by Jeremiah in chapter 15 and chapter 20 that every day he was mocked for the things that he said. Uh, and for 22 years, nothing had come to pass. And so he was mocked. Where is the word of God now? Let it come to pass. But it did come to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. And it came to pass very speedily thereafter. The consolation that Jeremiah was given when all the people were against him, when all the kings were against him, when all the war cabinet was against him, when the priests were against him, when there were false prophets, the consolation that he was given was he was given a remnant. And God said, stop praying for the nation. You won't save them. God said this, Jeremiah, it shall be well with your remnant. I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and the time of affliction. So God said, your remnant will be looked after well. Yes, some of them will go into captivity, but they will be looked after if they remain faithful. So Jeremiah, your job is not to go out and try and save the nation. Your job is to look after the remnant, educate the remnant. And we're going to see how that has a wonderful fulfillment in Ezekiel later on. But you think what it meant for Jeremiah, as he now is to see not just the loss of Josiah, the man of whom he said in, in Lamentations, we thought we would live under his shadow amongst the nations. That hope was still gone. He was to see three captivities, the captivity in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, when Daniel and the others were taken away. Then there was the great captivity in the days of Jehoiachin, where Ezekiel and others were taken away. Then there was the final captivity when the last of the good figs were taken away to Babylon for their own good. And over time, Jeremiah's Sunday school class and youth group was decimated by the captivity and some of his supporters like Uriah also were killed. Uriah was killed because he didn't remain faithful. But all of those who remained faithful to Jeremiah were looked after. Except, of course, after the captivity in Babylon, Gedaliah was to be killed by his own brethren. Let's just think about this remnant. We've given you a list before, but it included people like this. Daniel, Mordecai, friends of Daniel, Gemariah, 
there were two Gemariahs. There was a Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, a Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, um, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, the prophets, Micaiah, Gedaliah, Zekel and his wife, Ezra and Ahiakim, just to mention a few of the friends that we can get some information on. And what Jeremiah's job was to ignore in the next generation. He couldn't save the nation, but he had to go about inspiring the next generation who would become the good figs that would prepare the way for a good nation to come back from Babylon. Now, there were many families who supported Jeremiah. There was the family of Shaphan we're going to look at particularly tonight. It was the family of Hilkiah the high priest. He had a son called Gemariah, who later on allowed his chambers in the temple to be used for the reading of the words of Jeremiah. We have Uriah the prophet, who initially went out round the land repeating the words of Jeremiah. We have the family of Igdaliah. Igdaliah was called a man of God, and again, he supported the reading of the word of God in the temple buildings. The family of Neriah. Neriah had two sons that we know about called Barak, and we have a whole study on Barak later on, and Sariah, who was called the quiet prince. And he was also a man that went to Babylon to represent the word of God in that place. The house of the Rechabites. The family of the Rechabites were great supporters of Jeremiah, and they were a great example to others about keeping covenants. Ebed Melik, the Ethiopian, a servant of the king, rescues Jeremiah in chapter 38. And then we have the lovely man Gedaliah, with whom we will conclude today, the grandson of Shaphan, a, a wonderful man who I believe is, is a great character in the Bible for us to look at. So they were the supporters of Jeremiah that we know about, besides his remnant, his youth group, his Sunday school class that he had with those young people we mentioned. So let's come now to Shaphan the scribe. When the book of the law was found, when they were repairing the temple in the days of Josiah, that was in the the sixteenth. Uh, sorry, it was in the twentieth year, sixteenth year of Josiah when he was twenty six years of old, of age. So he came to the throne at eight, and when he was twenty six, the book of the law was found as they were repairing the temple that had been devastated by Manasseh. And so we have this reading of the law. They gave the book to Shaphan the scribe because, being a scholar of the Hebrew, he could read the writing of the ancient scroll. Now. We believe this was at least the book of Deuteronomy, for sure, uh, but maybe also all of the law of Moses. But certainly the book of Deuteronomy was included in what was read to the king. And the king was horrified when he heard now the words of God that had been hidden away in those 50 years of Manasseh's dominant reign over the kingdom of Judah. So Shaphan was a scribe, and he then went with his son, Gemariah, uh, to read that also to hold other prophetess and to take back the message from hold other prophetess back to the king. So this is the faithful scribe Shaphan. He was a man that was, was noted in many ways, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's just talk about his family. So he was a scribe. His sons were Ahikim, Gemariah, and Elisar, and Jaezaniah. And you'll learn later on why he's in red. There were grandsons, Micaiah and Gedaliah, and we'll say quite a bit about them as we come to them. So here's the family. Meshullam was was his great grand. He was his grandfather. Uh, that's a very common name. It may have been uh, several Meshullams around the place. Holder's husband was a Meshullam as well, but I don't think it was this one. So. Coming down through Shaphim, you have these four sons, Ahikim, Gemari, Elisar, and Jaazaniah. And then you have Gedaliah and Micah. And that's just a list of the references to where you'll find them in the Bible record. So we can find a few things out about them that God has recorded for us. Let's come now to Shaphim himself. His name means the prudent one. He was a faithful scribe, so he worked in, in the writing of the law and the defining of the law. And he worked with the young Josiah. So when King Amod was taken away and, and died, Josiah came to the throne at eight. And you can imagine around him there were many faithful counsellors who would make sure that he was directed in the right way. And that would have been Hilkiah the high priest and it would be Shaphan the scribe. But they didn't have a Bible to do it with. Um, so they were going from the memory of what their parents had told them about the ways of God. 
But nevertheless, they were godly men. Um, he'd kept most of his family godly in the evil reign of Manasseh. So at a time when the king's sons uh, of various generations were going wrong, when the nation was steeped in idolatry, the family of Shaphan had kept the ways of God, except for one son. He was sent by Josiah to restore the temple. So when you're going to commission somebody to restore the temple, you send the high priest, obviously, and you send down Shaphan the scribe to take charge of the process of the funds needed to pay for materials and to pay the workmen. And it's said of, of Shaphan that he was so trusted by the king that there was no accounting of his money handling. So everybody knew you could trust Shaphan the scribe. He read the law to Josiah when it was found in the ruins, took a hike in with him to consult with Holder, and it seems that probably being an older man, he died not long after the event because that's the last we hear of him. So that's Shaphan the scribe. Let's come now to Ahiakim, his son. Ahiakim is noted for his loyalty under pressure. I'd like you to come to chapter 26. This is the occasion where Jeremiah has rebuked the king and the people in very, very strong terms. In Jeremiah 26, this rebuke was done in the, in the temple or the gates of the temple. So Jeremiah 26 and verse 1, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, came this word. So right at the start of Jehoiakim's reign, an incredibly strong message comes from Jeremiah. And he was to do it in the king's house and probably in a feast time because it says there, when they come to worship in verse 2, from all the cities of Judah. And he was to speak these words and notice this very particularly. Jeremiah, you cannot diminish a word. You can't tone it down. You can't make it what people want to hear. You can't just say nice things, Jeremiah. Every word must be delivered in its full power from God. And hopefully, he says, God says, hopefully they will listen. So Jeremiah delivers this speech in the temple. And it's amazing, isn't it, that, that when he delivers this speech of condemnation and judgment that would be if they didn't repent and change their ways, that the reaction was that let's put Jeremiah to death. People don't want to hear this, this, this strong message that's coming from God. And there has to be a rescue of Jeremiah because they want to kill him. And, and we read this in verse 16. Then said the princes and all the people, and the, under the priests and the prophets, this man is not worthy to die. Now, why would they be saying that? Well, because the, the rulers had condemned Jeremiah to death. They wanted him put to death. And, and you know, there was this, this outcry. And, and you can imagine, can't you, that, you know, back in verse 11, then spake the priests and the prophets under, under the princes who were the war cabinet, this man is worthy to die because he's prophesied against the city. This was this was treason. This was, you know, subversion, undermining the, the morale of the people to say these things, that Babylon would capture the city. So the princes and the prophets wanted him killed, but the people, and particularly one of the people, stood up for Jeremiah and said he's not worthy to die. So there's now a great argument whether or not he should be put to death. Now, just notice this. Ahiakim worked alongside his faithful father. His name means a brother shall rise up. And that's interesting because when you come down to verse 17, it says, Then rose up certain of the elders of the land and spake to all the assembly of the people that Jeremiah should not be put to death. So, you know, there was a recognition that, look, you want to kill a man who's done nothing more than give you the words of Yahweh our God. And I believe that this was a speech from Ahiakim because it says, then rose up, and that's the meaning of his name. And I think that's a little clue in the Bible just telling us that it was Ahiakim that did this. And the argument Wade rages on through this chapter, and it ends up with these words in verse 24. Beautiful words. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. And, you know, that's interesting, isn't it? Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, supported Jeremiah. He was not handed over the people to be put to death. And I believe he was the brother that rose up and argued the case for Jeremiah to be rescued. But nevertheless, Jeremiah had to go into hiding, and he was put under house arrest by the king. He couldn't wander around the streets anymore. So 
you know, we find that later on that you know, Jeremiah says in this very same time period that he cannot leave his house. So he was put under house arrest, but the king now wanted him dead. And, and Jeremiah lived in great fear from this point on that the king would kill him. I want to just say something about the spirit of Ahiakim in supporting Jeremiah in a situation where he could have also himself been put to death for supporting Jeremiah's words. It took great courage to rise up and to speak on behalf of Jeremiah in the face of the hostile princes, the war cabinet and the prophets who despised Jeremiah and wanted him to die. It takes courage to do that. And there's great lessons which we can learn from that. When our brethren and our sisters are accused and maligned, under the law of Christ, they can't retaliate and defend themselves. They have to turn the other cheek. They have to learn to forgive. But that doesn't mean that we should not fight for them and for their honour, especially when they are falsely accused, especially when they have stood for the word of God and then are accused by evil minds. I want you to come to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 15. I want to show you something the Lord Jesus Christ said, which is really quite an amazing statement where we don't defend ourselves, but we defend the honour of someone else. Matthew 12 and verse 32. Matthew 12 and verse 32. Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. So what Jesus is saying is that if you want to criticise me, then I will forgive you. You can only imagine what it was like when Jesus was on the cross and people hurled insults and, and threats at him that he didn't answer any of them. He said, Father, forgive them. So Jesus says, you can insult me and I will forgive you. But he says in verse 32, if you blaspheme God, if you speak against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven you. So you blaspheme God, you blaspheme the, the will of God, the mind of God, it will not be forgiven to you. So, you know, we can, sometimes when we are wrongly accused, we have to take it patiently, we have to suffer wrong, turn the other cheek and not retaliate. Don't threaten back, don't abuse people. That's the spirit of Christ. But when our brethren and sisters are so accused, then we need to stand up for them. Now, these are some words from William Barclay in his book, The Mind of Jesus. He said this, Whenever Jesus' wrath appears, it always concerns a wrong done to others or a public evil that needs redress, but it never concerns a private injury. And that's an incredibly powerful statement. You know, Jesus condemned public evils, he condemned the hypocrisy and so forth, but he never defended himself. The truth of Christ's teaching seems to be that in our own person, and fortune, we should be ready to pardon all. It is our cheek we are to turn. It is our coat we are to give away. But when another's face has been buffeted, perhaps a little of the lion will become us best. That we are to suffer others to be injured or unjustly criticised is not conceivable, nor is it the spirit of Christ. And when you think about it, look how Christ defended people who were being accused or run down by other people. Think of how he defended Mary of Bethany on two separate occasions, once against her sister Martha, and once against Judas and the other disciples. Think of how he defended Zacchaeus. Think of how in John chapter 8, he defended the woman taken in adultery. Think of how he defended his disciples who were put under pressure by the Pharisees on a number of occasions. Think of how he defended John the Baptist against those who had taken his life away and against those who wondered about the mission of John. You know, Jesus was very quick to defend people who were being wrongly accused, abused or insulted. And, and I think the words of William Barclay are very powerful for us that we cannot let our brothers and sisters be falsely accused and not say something. We have to be courageous and stand up for the right and defend them because they can't defend themselves. And that's exactly what Ahiakim did, was to defend Jeremiah, even at great risk to his own life. But we're told later on that God had to hide him and Jeremiah from the persecution that would come. Interesting, isn't it? But let's just take the lesson that Barclay has highlighted for us. 
Well, then we come to another son of Shaphan called Elisar. And Elisar gets one mention in the record. It's in Jeremiah 29. And this was a letter that was written in the days of um, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, when he was still on the throne. And Jeremiah wrote a prophecy, a letter that was sent to Babylon by the hand of Elisar, who was going on a delegation for the king to Babylon anyway. So Jeremiah sent a letter along with Elisar to be read in Babylon. And with him was Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, who was, of course, the son of the high priest. Another family supported him. But you think about this message. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem under the residue of the elders which were carried away captives and of the priests and the prophets and all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So many of them have been captive now for 20 years or so, um, some of them less time than that, but they were in Babylon. And this message was after the Jeconiah, the king and queen, or it should be the queen mother, had been taken away. Um, and the eunuchs and the princes to Jerusalem and the carpenters dismissed and so forth were all gone. So the timing is there. This is this is in the reign of Zedekiah. And you can imagine Zedekiah had many reasons to send a delegation to Babylon, perhaps to pay his tribute, perhaps to negotiate his tribute, um, whatever it was. But it was a delegation sent by the king. And Jeremiah sends a letter in the hand of Elisar, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah. Well, what a letter it was. You think about this letter. Um, how popular would it be when it got to Babylon? You think about it. This letter was to say, you're going to be there for 70 years. Now, there were prophets in Jerusalem like Hananiah saying, within two years you'll come home. There were false prophets in Babylon who were saying that they would come home early. But surely they can't stay in Babylon very long. Jeremiah writes a letter saying, settle down, build houses, plant vineyards, and pray for the peace of Babylon. And that was regarded by the Jews in Babylon as high treason that they should have to pray for the peace of Babylon. And you can imagine Elisar and Gemariah reading this law, this letter of Jeremiah, reading it over and over again to the different groups of captives in Babylon as they went around amongst them, and the unpopularity they would suffer by repeating the words of God through Jeremiah. Pray for the peace of Babylon. You'll be here for 70 years. Well, false prophets rose up against them. When you come to Jeremiah 29, we find that as a result of this letter, there were a number of false prophecies that came along. Back in verse 25, a letter went back to Jerusalem. Um, and this letter came to from a man called Zephaniah, the son of Maasiah suggesting that the priests back in Jerusalem should kill Jer should kill Jeremiah. Um, so again, there was there was letters going back the other way um, and, and trying to undermine the work of Jeremiah. When you come to verse 20, part of the prophecy that was given is this. Hear therefore the word of Yahweh, all ye of the captivity, whom I have sent to Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, of Ahab the son of Kaliah, and Zedekiah the son of Maasiah, which prophesied a lie unto you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them to the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall slay them before your eyes. And of them shall be taken up a curse for all the captivity of Judah, which are in Babylon, saying, Yahweh make thee like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire because they have committed villainy in Israel, committed adultery with their neighbors' wives, and have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them, which I know and am a witness, saith Yahweh. So you see, God reinforced the letter of Jeremiah by saying to the captivity that you have people there giving you false prophecies, and they are immoral people to boot. You know, that they're taking their neighbors' wives. And they're telling you evil things that are wrong. They're telling you the captivity won't be long. Well, God says, you watch what I'm going to do to them. And you learn the lesson because they're going to be roasted in the fire. Now, we know that Daniel and his friends had been rescued from the fiery furnace of the king of Babylon. 
but these two would not be. And somehow they fell out of favour with the king, maybe through the influence of Daniel, maybe through you know, the words of Jeremiah being became well known in Babylon. Whatever it was, the king of Babylon had them cast into the fire and there was no rescue for them. And they were taken out of the way because they were false prophets and they were immoral men. So again, this, this letter goes across at the hand of Elisar and part of the letter was the condemnation of these evil prophets. So Elisar was prepared to be unpopular to those Jews in Babylon who didn't want to hear about a long captivity and didn't want to hear about praying for the peace of Babylon. We come now to another character, and I find this a wonderful example of a young man's enthusiasm. This was the occasion in Jeremiah 36 of the reading of the law. As I said again in our opening study, book of Jeremiah is completely the books are out of order, and you need to look for the time periods involved in each chapter. So in Jeremiah 36, we're in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. So back at the time of the first captivity, just before the first captivity, um, we now have the writing of the words of Jeremiah. So Barak was given the command to write out all the speeches of Jeremiah that had been given to this point of time in the mission of Jeremiah. So that was the 18 years that he had with Josiah. Uh, it included the first four years of Jehoiakim. And all the speeches of Jeremiah that had been verbally delivered were now to be written down by Barak the scribe. And Barak, we know, we're going to see in the study on Barak, he wrote the words out and then because they were so terrible in their import, he had a major depression and it took a year before the, the book could actually be read uh, in the temple. But when it was finally read, the the book was to be read and it was to be read in the, in the temple and uh, in the chamber of Gemariah, um, who was now the chief scribe in the nation. So Gemariah has taken over the role of his father, Shaphan the scribe, and Gemariah sponsored the public reading of Barak's scroll and his changes in the temple. Now, there was a young man who was listening to this, and this young man we read about uh, in verse 11. Let's just go back and pick it up in verse um, 10. Then Barak read the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of Yahweh, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate of Yahweh's house, in the ears of all the people. So there was a particular room or chamber over the gate, which was the chamber of Gemariah, and that you could then talk to all the people who were in the courts of the temple. So this was a very public reading. But there was a young man listening. In verse 11, Micah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, when he heard out of the words, out of the words of Yahweh, he was moved. He was he was greatly moved by what he heard. He, he, he realized that, that the nation was in a terrible dilemma, that they were about to be destroyed by the Babylonians and that the Babylonians were marching against them. And he got very moved by these words of Jeremiah. And he did an incredible thing. He rushed us to the palace. In verse 12, he went to the king's house uh, under the scribe's chamber, which was the, the meeting room where the cabinet was, and where it says the princes were there. Now, the princes are... Uh, this, was, this was a war cabinet because they were under threat from the Babylonians. And you've got all the, the chief leaders and the, the men of the nation there discussing what to do about this impending invasion. And suddenly the doors burst open. In comes a teenager. This this grandson of, of Shaphan burst in and said, you've got to hear the words of Jeremiah. And amazing, isn't it? And he, he, you get to listen to all the people. There. You've got all Nathan, the king's father-in-law, is there. Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, is there. So Gemariah obviously had been forced to go to the cabinet meeting while in his chambers the law is being read. Um, Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the princes are there. And, and Micaiah Mike, just bursts out of this cabinet meeting. He declared unto all the words that he heard. And Barak read the word of the, of the law. And the princes said, look, this is amazing. So the princes then called for the scroll. And when they've read it, they said it must go to the king. So we find that Gemariah then reads it to the king. And it's quite amazing, isn't it, that that it's actually brought before the king. And even El Nathan says to the king, you should take notice of this. But no, all Jehoiakim does is to burn it. And it just shows, doesn't it, the, the enthusiasm of this young man to, to rush away from the temple and go down to the king's house and to burst into the cabinet meeting and to say, you've got to listen to this. And, and then 
to have those words finally arrive at the king's doorstep. So again, there's a young man with great enthusiasm for the word of God. And you know what an impact it had upon him. Just a little snapshot of another member of the family of Shaphan. But quite often in a godly family, there's a black sheep. The prophecy we have here is in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. It was given in the last five years of the reign of King Zedekiah, the last five years before they were finally destroyed and the temple was destroyed and they went into captivity, all of them. Ezekiel is shown a vision. And part of that vision was when he went into the temple, he saw every form of creeping things and abominable beasts. And it's just you know, the picture we have here is it's almost like putting a projector through someone's head and, and all the, the evil thoughts and the imaginations that they indulge in are then portrayed upon the wall. And Ezekiel sees in the, in the house of God the, the, the idols of the house portrayed on the wall. And it was what was going on in their minds. And then he says, I saw 70 men, so the Sanhedrin, the ancients of the house of Israel, the people who should have been leading the nation. And one man of the 70 is named. In the midst of them stood Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, and every man with a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. And, you know, Ezekiel's vision of the hole in the wall is a tragedy because there's only one man named in that 70 people who were with evil minds. And it was the son of Shaphan. You know, this was an insight given to Ezekiel that he might convince those in Babylon that God, with great justification, was about to destroy the temple and the city that they so much loved. So how did Jehazaniah end up so wrong? When his brothers Ahiakim and Elisar and Gemariah and his and Gemariah's son Micaiah were so faithful. How do we get such an evil son, the son of Shaphan, back in Jerusalem at this time? I believe he had a godly upbringing. But human nature is given free will by God. And some decide to follow their own lusts, and Jehazaniah appears to have done that. His name that he was given by his parents means attentive to Yahweh. But he certainly wasn't. They had hoped that he would follow in the spirit of the family, but he didn't. His attitude is given to us very clearly in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 12. If we just go there and we're told exactly what the thinking of Jezaniah and his companions was. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the angels of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery for they say, Yahweh seeth us not, Yahweh has forsaken the earth. And this is a person that's decided that there is no God, or if there is a God, that he doesn't care, and therefore we can do exactly what we want to do in our own minds. And, and it was portrayed on the wall, the thoughts of men like Jehazaniah, that the Jews in Babylon might understand why God would have to destroy that temple and that city. So there's a sad chapter in the family of Shaphan. Well, the end was to come in the days of Zedekiah. In the 11th year of Zedekiah, the city finally fell after an 18-month siege. There had been great loss of life through famine and through disease and by the destruction of the Babylonians. All the leaders were taken up to Riblah and slain. The high priest, the scribes, the 70 Sanhedrin were killed by the king of Babylon. The war cabinet was killed by the king of Babylon. And King Zedekiah, his dynasty was extinguished. This king that had been given so many opportunities by Jeremiah to hear the word of God was to see the most terrible thing before he died. The last thing he saw with his eyes was his sons, one by one, being killed by the Babylonians in front of him. And then his own eyes were poked out. He was put in chains and he was sent to Babylon and there died in prison. That's what happens to covenant breakers 
and to people who will not act on the word of God. And that was the sad fate of Zedekiah. But the Babylonians took away the majority of the people, and especially those who were of some use to them. They left behind the poor and the sick and the diseased, the disheartened, and a lot of renegade guerrilla bands that were hiding in the forests of the east of Jordan. They left behind a remnant, and they left behind Jeremiah and Barak. And they left behind a man called Gedaliah. I want to talk about Gedaliah. Now, Gedaliah is, is a wonderful person. There are many lessons we can take from Gedaliah. Look what the record says. As for the people that remained in the land of Judah, who Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, even over them he made Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, ruler. So now that there are no kings left in the land, a man is made to be a governor, and he's a grandson of Shaphan, and he's a good man. And look what it says, and, and the Bible is succinct in what it says. When all the captains of the armies, they and their men, now these are the, the captains of guerrilla bands who had been working with the Ammonites and the Moabites, hiding in the forests of Israel, uh, away from the Babylonians, conducting a guerrilla campaign against the Babylonian armies. So these men now came out of hiding after the Babylonians have gone, and they came to get a, get a liar at Mizpah. And the leaders were Ishmael and Johanan. And there was Sarai, the son of Tanhumath, and Jehazanite. So four bands of guerrilla fighters now came out of the woodwork, but they came to get a liar. Now, why would they come to get a liar? Because the Babylonians had put him in charge, um, but because they knew he was a good man. And get a liar said to them, he swear to them and to their men, said to them, Fear not to be the servants of the Chaldees. Dwell on the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. And he was passing on what Jeremiah had been telling the kings of Judah for so long. If you submit to Babylon, if you surrender to Babylon, then you can live in peace in this land. And Gedaliah was telling the captains of these bands that they could do that. So he was a good man. Um... He was a remarkable man because he was trusted even by these guerrilla fighters. And then we come to Jeremiah chapter 40. If just go to Jeremiah 40 and just see what it says to him there in very similar terms about the way that the people came to him. And you get an impression that everybody knew that this was a man that you could trust. So in Jeremiah 40 and verse 10, it says this. And verse 9 um, Oh, verse, let's go back to verse 7. And when the captains of the forces which were in the fields and they and the men, they heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Ahiakim governor and had committed unto him men and women and children of the poor of the land and then that were not carried away, then they came to Gedaliah. So, again, that, that little phrase, they came to Gedaliah and then lists off the same men. And you get an idea, don't you, that, that these people um, were happy to have Gedaliah ruling over them. Um, the end of verse 11, uh, the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah and that he had said over them, Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan. Even all the Jews returned out of the places where they were driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah, the Mizpah, and they gathered wine and summer fruits very much. So again, that those who had been hiding in the in the caves and in the mountains and, and in the forests all now came out of the woodwork and came back to get a liar because here's a man you can trust. Here's a man that is obeying God in, in, in serving the Babylonians for these 70 years. And again in verse 13, they came to get a liar to Mizpah. So, you know, get a liar was a man that everybody trusted to rule over them in a right way and to rule under the Babylonians. But before this, there was something wonderful that Gedaliah had done. And it's the carrying home of Jeremiah. Just come back to Jeremiah 39 and verse 14. And just to give you a thumbnail a sketch of what had happened when the city fell in the 11th year of Zedekiah, that there was tremendous confusion in a time of siege and when the walls eventually were broken through, the Babylonians slaughtered the defenders of the city 
Many people who were dying of starvation and disease were just left to die in the streets. But the prisons had to be opened up. And in the prisons, they marched the prisoners out in chains and sent them off towards Riblar up in the north. And lost amongst the prisoners that had been sent out of the prisoners, prisons by the Babylonian army, was Jeremiah. And he was marched up to Ramah, as far as Ramah, north of Jerusalem. And the Babylonian generals were in absolute frantic panic because the king of Babylon had given strict instructions that Jeremiah was to be looked after. And that, of course, probably reflects the influence of Daniel upon the kings and his generals. But they were under almost threat of death, as it were, if Jeremiah was not found and looked after. And, of course, when they couldn't find him, there was immense panic amongst the Babylonians. And eventually they found him at, Ru at Ramah in chains. And, of course, they then gave him free choice. He could go to Babylon as an honoured guest or he could stay in the land of Judah. Whatever he chose to do, he had right to make that choice. A remarkable thing that the Babylonians should care for him so much, and obviously I think Daniel had an influence in that because he was his father's friend. But look what the record says very beautifully in chapter 39 and verse 14. Or verse 13. So Nebuchadnezzar Zadan, the captain of the guard, sent a Nebuchadnezzar and Rab Saras and Negal Shariza, Rab Mag, and all the king of Babylon's princes. And they sent and they took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison. Of course, they had unfortunately taken him north, as chapter 40, verse uh, 1 says. Um, they committed him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home. And he dwelt amongst the people. Now, just looking at chapter 40, verse 1, you see that they actually found him at Ramah. And he'd been taken there in chains. So just need to put those two records together. So here's this old prophet who's just had years in prison, who's just been come out of that terrible pit that was such a mental anguish to him, in that horrible pit that he was put into, who's been starving for food in the, in the siege of the city and had been abused and persecuted and whipped all his life and mocked all his life. And here he is being dragged off in chains to Ramah. And you can imagine what state he was in. And, and that's why the record so beautifully says, Gedaliah carried him home. And you can imagine what Jeremiah was like and what condition he really was. So that was a wonderful thing that Gedaliah did. And, and everybody had a total respect for Gedaliah uh, as he was made governor over the land. For having rescued Jeremiah, he was made governor by the Babylonians and he was advised by Jeremiah and Barak. So the three of them were basically a ruling triumvirate but it was Gedaliah who was the governor. Gedaliah then has a problem because he's now caught between two warring factions. Two of those captains of the guerrilla armies, Johanan and Ishmael, hated each other. And they both had designs upon getting the governorship or the kingship for themselves. So Gedaliah is now faced with these people who have come out of the woodwork, have decided to be under him, but have not forgotten their own personal ambitions. And both of these guys were, were murderers, and both of them were devious men. And what happens is, being caught between these two people, Jehanan comes to him and says, there's a plot going on, Ishmael is going to kill you, and he wants to seize the rulership. And it's quite a tragic thing, isn't it, that poor old Gedaliah in chapter 43 is faced with this problem of being warned about his impending murder, by a man that he doesn't trust either. And, you know, you just wonder, don't you, what he really thought of it, but he didn't have a lot of choice. And and so, you know, he says that we have to, you know, we have to give think the best of Ishmael. Look at chapter 43 and verse 6. Picking it up in chapter 40 of Jeremiah, and we want to pick up the record in verse 15. Then Jehoiada, the son of Korea, spake to Gedaliah in Mizpah secretly. So he comes along and he says, whispering, Let me go, I pray, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and nobody will know it. So I'll just quietly kill this guy that wants to kill you. Um, wherefore should he slay that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? So 
Jehanan makes an offer to him to conduct a preemptive strike upon Ishmael, to kill him secretly and to do it privately so that this threat to the rulership of Gedaliah can be taken away. And Gedaliah refuses to go along with it. Verse 16, Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, said unto Jehanan, the son of Korea, Thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. Well, sadly, in the next chapter, Ishmael does murder Gedaliah. But he cannot agree to a preemptive murder. I want to talk about this spirit of Gedaliah, which I think is such a great lesson to us. Now, there is a, an unfortunate policy in the world that the end justifies the means. And sadly, that sometimes comes into our brotherhood. Sometimes people think if they're fighting for the right cause, they can use the wrong methods. They can use ungodly methods. They can lie. They can tell half-truths. They can use threats, scheming. They can rig business meetings. Um, they can hide important letters. They can call in obligations that people have. Uh, all of these things can happen amongst any community, and it's sadly at times happened even in our community because people have the idea that the end justifies the means. And we learn from Gedaliah a very great lesson that even though he may have suspected Ishmael, he speaks of him kindly and he will not go along with an ungodly method of removing the threat which he's been told about. You know, this spirit of Gedaliah is a wonderful spirit, which the Bible says, love imputes not evil. It's from the first of Corinthians 13. Love imputes not evil. So even though we might suspect people, even though we might think people are plotting against us, we have to be leaving it in the hands of God. We have to be like Gedaliah and try and think the best of people. And we must not respond ever with ungodly tactics. You know, love, we're told in Corinthians 13, hears all things, beareth all things, and promotes not itself. That's true godly love. And many people have made commentary about Gedaliah because he was killed in chapter 41 and verse 10. He was murdered by Ishmael. Ishmael then takes the daughters of Zedekiah, which were still alive, over to Ammon, to the Ammonites, and tried, of course, to continue the line of the kings of Israel without success. But interesting, isn't it, that Johanan, Johanan was right. There was a plot to kill Gedaliah. And Gedaliah appears to have been unwilling to look at it. But was that the case? You know, many commentators say Gedaliah was too simple, too naive, that he was not astute politically to see the threat that was posed by Ishmael. Some say he was a poor statesman, too trusting. What they don't understand is that a godly person practices what is right. He set an example to Israel that they couldn't go on with this infighting that had been so characteristic of the time of the kings and the false prophets. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously and that judges eternally. And we must ourselves refuse to be part of any political scheming that uses ungodly tactics in our life in the ecclesial world. Because God watches the affairs of ecclesias. Our part is to do the right thing always. Yes, we may have to fight for the truth sometimes. Yes, we may have to make stands on things that are unpopular. But we always do it in a brotherly fashion. I've always made it a policy, even when debating with brethren who have wrong doctrine, to keep calling them brother so-and-so because... The minute we get away from realizing that they are brethren, we can easily get into personal insults. Always be careful about the party spirit that these captains of these guerrilla armies showed. It's always trust in God and deal honestly to deal always in godly terms, no matter how badly others might behave. And even though Gedaliah was a great loss to the nation, it wasn't unexpected because God was saying that this remnant that was left after the captivity would finally be destroyed in Egypt, and so they were. 
and the promising start that Gedaliah made was now ruined by these ambitious captains of these guerrilla armies. But God has the future for people like Gedaliah. These are beautiful words from Isaiah 57, verse 1 and 2, which I believe apply to Enoch and to Gedaliah. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. That, of course, was true of Josiah, wasn't it? He shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. So, Sometimes good men are taken away. Sometimes good men are slain by the wicked. But they're not forgotten by God. God grants them some peace and certainly grants them a future. And so God says in Revelation, Blessed are those dying in the Lord. They rest from their labours and their works do follow them. And that's certainly true of Gedaliah. He was a wonderful man. Everybody came to him. He carried Jeremiah home. He tried his best to give some leadership and guidance to those who were left back in the land after the last captivity. But the time was not right for that to be done. And so he went into peace and the, the people went down to Egypt in disobedience to the words of Jeremiah. So we take away the exhortations to always be godly people and to do the right thing. Now, these are the words of James 3, verse 14 to 18 from Weymouth. But if in your hearts you have bitter feelings of envy and rivalry, do not speak boastfully and falsely in defiance of the truth. You see, the end does not justify the means. That is not the wisdom which comes from above. It belongs to the earth, to the unspiritual nature, to the evil spirits. You see, that was Johanan's attitude. Let's go and kill him before he kills us. For envy and rivalry are, these are, there are also unrest and every vile deed, and the secret murder would have been a vile deed. The wisdom from above is first of all pure. It has to be pure in motive, then peaceful. The intent of everything we do must be eventually to generate peace. Courteous, always well-mannered, not self-willed, not determined to get our own way and to win the fight full of compassion and kind actions, free from favouritism and all insincerity. And you see, that's what sowing peace is. Those who strive for peace, there will be a seed planted, which is the harvest of righteousness. Sadly, in Gedaliah's case, it was not the time for that to be, but it will be an eternal reward for him because he sowed peace. So even then, people falsely accuse us, when people mistreat us, when people abuse us, we must adopt the spirit of Christ. Hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know, Jesus never got involved in guile or trickery or deceit. Jesus never retaliated in personal defence. He never threatened anybody and couldn't if he had made some threats, but he didn't. He put the matter in God's hands, and that needs to be our spirit. It's also the spirit of Gedaliah. So Jeremiah would lose another faithful friend, one of the few of his friends that would actually suffer death, and he lost Gedaliah. The, the grandson of Shaphan, who had looked after him so well. The collapse of the nation was imminent and would follow in a very short time as they went down to Egypt against the words of Jeremiah, against the words of God, and Nebuchadnezzar would come down and destroy them there. Jeremiah was always losing his Sunday school class, his youth group, and his faithful friends, mostly to captivity and sometimes, like Gedaliah, to death. But God said, your remnant will be saved eternally. It shall be well with thee and with thy remnant. And I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil, in the time of affliction. That had happened. The Babylonians were under strict instructions to look after Jeremiah and his friends. And so they did. 
And you see, that promise that God gave about Jeremiah's remnant came to pass, and they were spared. They, they were not killed like many others were in Jerusalem at that time. I am with thee to deliver thee, saith Yahweh. And when the, re the Lord Jesus Christ returns, they will certainly be delivered into eternal life because they were such faithful people as the world of their nation collapsed around them. Let us take away the lessons of the family of Shaphan and especially the good man, Get a liar.